and of Jehovah's Witnesses. We welcome you this afternoon to our special talk uh, entitled, Keep Working Out Your Own Salvation. Now this talk will be given to us by Brother Brown, Brother Jared Brown. Brother Brown has been in full-time service for um, 40 odd years. He served in both the circuit and the district work. Uh, he's been a member of the Bethel family for over 20 years, since 1980, uh, and uh, he served both at, in Brooklyn and at Patterson. Uh, he's currently in the uh, Office of Public Affairs at uh, Brooklyn Bethel, so we ask that you give your uh, uh, undivided attention to Brother Brown. We're very happy to see you, and certainly would like to commend you on arranging this very fine Saturday afternoon to do something spiritual. We know you put things aside to accommodate this special program, but we too realize why you wanted to make this memorial season as spiritual affair as you possibly could. So certainly that makes Jehovah's heart glad to know that you care about him and you care about, as you were singing, that divine instruction that comes from him down to us. And while there are scores of things you could be doing and likely many things you put off doing to be here, we have again an opportunity to enjoy together a rich spiritual meal as we did on our memorial evening. Now, as mentioned by the chairman, we want to give discussion here to this thing, keep working out your own salvation, and by salvation here, we mean your everlasting life. If it is possible for you one day to live on this land forever, then you will, in effect, have been saved. And that results from you working out your own salvation. Now, different points of view exists religiously regarding salvation and being saved. Uh, one popular one among religionists is once saved, always saved. So if you would introduce a topic as we have this afternoon, working out your own salvation, it wouldn't make a lot of sense because they feel you're either saved or you're not saved. What is there they feel to work out in connection with salvation. But now, if you study the Bible seriously for just a little while, you know that view is not in harmony with what is stated in the scriptures, that the scriptures do not support the idea of once saved, always saved. But now, even though you know that, you still may have a fundamental problem in this matter of working out your own salvation. For example, even many people who know the truth and are dedicated to God feel even though there is going to be everlasting life enjoyed by millions at some undisclosed time in the future, some have started to feel, I don't know if I personally will be one of them. In other words, they say, yes, it's going to happen. I believe that. I have faith in it. But when I look at myself and I look at the requirements that God has set forth in his word, and then I judge my own performance, and I look at my weaknesses, imperfections, shortcomings, and thus sins, some say, I don't know if I'm personally going to be able to make it. So just having an accurate understanding of what salvation can offer doesn't mean you are necessarily proceeding in a proper and appropriate way to work this matter out. For example, now, in harmony with the last view we expressed, take a look at Romans chapter 7. This is something a zealous servant of God, the Apostle Paul, said in connection with his service to God. 
And I'm sure you will be able to relate to it. All of us will. Romans chapter 7. We're only going to read verse number 18. Now, he's very personal when he says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, there dwells nothing good. For ability to wish is present with me, but ability to work out what is fine is not present. Honesty, isn't it? He says, yes, I have the ability to wish. I know the way I'd like to be. I know the way I want to direct my life. But when I start looking at what I'm able to do in the way of performance, to bring this about, to effect this for me, then he says, this matter of trying to work out what is fine and what's going to please God with consistency, so I qualify for that reward. He says, it's just not with me to work this out. And that's what many today say. Some trying to get the truth. They may have some bad habit, deeply ingrained habit, that they're told you have to change to get the truth. There is such a thing as addiction. Some are addicted to cigarettes. They know they have to change from that as part of being a faithful servant to God. Others are addicted to harder drugs. Some are addicted to alcohol. We're even told today there's such a thing as sexual addiction, which causes promiscuity on the part of individuals seeking to get the truth. We get letters at the society. Listen to this one. Here's a young man. Now, he's not baptized, but he expresses sort of what we read Paul said there about what it's like to try to work out what is fine. Just some excerpts. He says, I've been studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses for several months now. Good. He says, uh, I'll soon finish uh, the uh, knowledge book. I've shown much progress and my Bible study conductor is expecting me to join the ministry school very soon and become an unbaptized publisher. I would love to do so, but I just can't. It's this ma- habit of masturbation that I have. I've been struggling with it for years. I'm too embarrassed to approach the elders with my problem. I've tried everything that I can to think how I can break this habit. I've read the Bible and prayed, pleaded to Jehovah, tried to clear my mind of unclean thoughts and much more. However, I have not even been able to go as far as one week without giving in to this unclean habit. I feel terrible. I do not feel as though I can make further progress as long as I have this habit. I try and try, but continue to fail Jehovah. I can imagine his disapproval of me. I just can't seem to act in harmony with my prayer. I have become very worried and very depressed because of this unclean habit. I can feel Jehovah's anger and disgust with me. Many times I wonder why Jehovah's Holy Spirit has drawn me to the truth. I am obviously incapable of conforming to Jehovah's laws. I pray and read from the Bible daily. However, I feel as though my worship is in vain. This is because I know that Jehovah does not hear the prayers of willful sinners. I cannot say that I have given in to my desire to masturbate always because of weakness. Many times I do it without even putting up any resistance. And then he goes on to say a few other things and respectfully ends his letter. Well, that's what we just read. Does he want to be this way? Or is it a matter, as the Apostle Paul said, that ability to work out what is fine just can't seem to do it at times. And that's what we're talking about in this matter 
of working out your own salvation yes ability to wish we all want to live everlastingly in a paradise on this earth serving the true god but we deal with imperfection that's one kind but we all individually have things that we continually must deal with in order to go in the direction that pleases God. But now, here's the good side. Now, that was sort of the negative, and we have to deal with that too because it does exist. But despite our imperfections, our weaknesses, our shortcomings, we are encouraged by our God to go ahead and do it, try to work it out. Now, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Here is now our principal discussion here. And the same writer, the same one that here in Romans 7, 18, Paul told us about himself, honestly acknowledging his own weaknesses and inability, he felt to work out what is fine, in Philippians 2, look at verse 12, the same writer says, Consequently, my beloved ones, in the way that you have always obeyed, not during my presence only, but now much more readily during my absence, keep working out your own salvation with fear and trust. The same man. The same man who said about himself at times the ability to work out what's fine and actually do it in a disciplined way was not there. He encouragingly wrote the brothers there and he said, uh, keep working out your own salvation. We need to know what he meant then. Uh, there's insight in understanding what exactly he means here working out maybe that's not conveying exactly to our minds what it should well here's a definition and I think the definition is very encouraging because in defining the original language word which was Greek here's what it tells us about working out this verb it says it basically means to accomplish something but not in the sense of fulfillment but of carrying out a matter now we start then to see something that, that's very interesting here working out yes it means you have to accomplish something you got to carry out something but it says not to the point of fulfillment you can't get over there that far so when the scriptures tell us, Paul being the vehicle here to bring it to our attention, that we need to keep working out our salvation, it's telling us, yes, there are things you have to do and that you can accomplish along the way, but you're not going to be able to bring it to fulfillment. You're imperfect, you're a sinner, you can't go that far. There are things you must do, you can do. It's within your power and imperfect ability to do so. But as far as fulfilling for yourself, salvation, none of us can take it that far. Now, interestingly, the tense of the Greek verb, and it's expressed nicely in our rendering here, is in Greek what they call the continuative present. You don't really have to say a lot about it because that uh, particular tense defines itself. The continuative presence in Greek means clearly you keep striving, you keep doing. So that's where in English putting this word keep, okay, it's saying you must keep on making accomplishments. You must continue to go from here to here. You can't let up. You can't stop. There are things you must do, but don't think that you can bring it to fulfillment. That's what is going to discourage you. Because if any of us gain salvation and thus everlasting life, it won't be within our own strength or ability. In fact, we could say categorically, any of us that gain salvation 
we will play the minor role in gaining salvation. And the major role will be played by the one who wants us to have everlasting life, and that's Jehovah God. See, we must enter that with that perspective. Otherwise, we're going to take too much on ourselves. That's what Paul was talking about when he says, ability to wish is present. And we all acknowledge, yes, we wish we could be different. We wished to have everlasting life. But if it's up to me to work it out, it would never happen. And that's true of every single one of us. That's why, did you notice, interestingly, Paul took the Hebrew expression. He reached back and picked up a very popular uh, Hebrew idiomatic expression when he said, with fear and trembling. Did you know that was a Hebrew? He picked it up. Uh, for note takers, let me give you just two references. Psalm 211. Some people take notes and they'll come up after. Well, where is it in the Hebrew scripture? So let's put it out. And Isaiah 19, 16. So that's just a couple of places where it is. But now, key to our understanding is, is what it means. And what it means that whatever you're doing, there you're doing it with a humble reverence and dependence and devotion to God. So they would tack that on to many things with uh, fear and trembling. And that meant whatever I'm talking about here, whatever I'm doing or striving after, I know it is with humility and dependence and devotion to God. And that's what we really say. As we work toward everlasting life or work out this salvation, we move along making accomplishments. Accomplishments within our imperfect ability to do but we do so with fear and trembling because the fulfillment of working out salvation is something that Jehovah God has to do. So then basically, two roles are played here in our gaining salvation. The major role is played by Jehovah God because he is the one that will fulfill that for us. And then the lesser or subordinate role we play. Now, let's consider what each role is. That'll help us to work out our own salvation. Now, first, let's take the role of Jehovah God. This must be clearly understood. Otherwise, we could easily become discouraged or feel it's impossible or like some have started to feel now. It's so long. I don't know if I can do it. Endurance is coming in. There's so many pressures and problems and trials and difficulty. It's going to happen. They say, I believe that, but I don't think I can do it. And basically, we would agree with them. You can't do it. And that's why we have to understand the major role, or as they might express it in contemporary uh, vernacular, the key player is Jehovah God. And the subordinate role is the one that we play. So now let's take the role of Jehovah God. Look at verse 13. Please hold to where you are, Philippians chapter 2. Now, follow closely. It says, For God is the one that, for the sake of his good pleasure, is acting within you in order for you both to will and to act. Now, that says a lot. Let's don't run away from this too fast. Now, is Jehovah's role something he wants to do, that he likes to do? It says it's for the sake of his good pleasure. So right away, we have to believe this. Here is a God that wants you to have everlasting life. Here is a God that wants you to have salvation. That's part of of his good pleasure. So what is he doing? Now there his role is described. It says he is acting within you. Now that's by means of his Holy Spirit. He is acting in our hearts. The interior. The person we are inside. Because basically that's what he's going to judge. God judges our heart. The man we are inside, that's what we mean by our heart. 
that's where the determination is made whether we please him or not. It's not what others think of us. This time of everlasting life, what's going to matter is what God thinks. If everybody else votes for you, it won't mean anything if that's not his assessment. So we have to see he, he's the one that is trying to help us. So it says he is acting within you in order for you both to will and to act. So now, by means of his spirit, within those who want to work out their own salvation, it says he's helping you. Now, once again, notice this continuous. It said he is acting within you. Uh, one translation, uh, today's English version, I like the way they put it. It says he's always at work in you by means of his spirit and what's the goal now there was the key thing it said in order for you both to will and to act question it's rhetorical think about not to raise your hand do you know what that means by means of his spirit that he is acting within you in order for you to will and to act. When it says there, his Holy Spirit is acting in you in order for you to will, and this is the important thing, it means his Spirit is acting to cause you to want to have everlasting life, to cause you to be glad to work at everlasting life. And when in particular it kicks in, is just when things get low, you feel you can't do it. All of us have been there. We get discouraged, if not depressed. We feel down. We feel disgusted with ourselves. I read about that new brother who's trying to qualify to be a publisher and get baptized. Very discouraged, dispirited. He's feeling, I don't think I can ever do this. This has got a hold on me. I can't seem to move it on. Well, instead of letting one then be dismissed in their desire to work out their own salvation, it is at those points that God then acting within us causes us to want to keep on going. And not only that, it's even stronger. He causes us to be glad to keep on. when it seems that nothing is working out there. When it seems that from a human point of view, we might as well throw the towel in. We can't make it. And his spirit is acting within you. And it's going to cause you to will or to want to or to be glad to in other words, to pull out of that and say, yes, let me keep on going. If not, we would all be swallowed by imperfection, guilt, feelings of inadequacy, and of being too great a sinner. So it is important for us to have that perspective on things. When we have that perspective on things, then when there are trials, and we come under pressure, then Jehovah plays his role by means of his spirit. Instead of letting us get to the point of no return where we want to give up on the whole thing, he causes us to want to keep going, to will. When our will wears out and there is not there that personal determination, then that spirit will see that there is enough there to make us uh, glad to want to go on, to be determined to do so. Likewise, when there's temptation. And temptation can come anywhere, can come in any form. What's temptation to one person may not necessarily be to another, but we all know what it is. It is that urging and prodding and pushing to do what is wrong and what displeases God. Well, see, again, that's where his spirit 
working within you causes you to want to go on. Now, that's why we say with Jehovah God, he is the primary agent when it comes to working out our salvation. He is the one that keeps us going when even we feel it's too much, it's too difficult, I can't humanly do it. He doesn't let us fall off the screen. He's in there by means of his spirit to perk us up, give us what is needed to restore the determination by causing us to want to, or to be glad to, or to keep on. So we do have help. And it is that kind of activity that will in fact bring us to this reward of everlasting life. The fulfillment of it anyway. All right, now let's go to our role. We can clearly see why this is major with God. He's right there, always at work in me by means of his spirit isn't going to abandon us with that. He knows what we want to do and our ability to wish and he's going to cooperate with that. So we see his role. Now let's take our own role. While not the major one, it's very important. Remember we said this matter of working out meant you had to make accomplishments not to the point of fulfillment, but you had to do things. You had to reach certain points. And it was not impossible for you to do this. Because he understands and knows that we are near dust. But he does have things for us to do. So now let's talk a little bit about our role. Now you remember as we just read there in verse 13. We said he's acting within us by means of his Holy Spirit. Now, that's the key for all of us. That means our role then is basically going to be to cooperate with that spirit. That spirit provides the direction. That spirit provides what is needed to move us along. But we've got to make it our determination that we're going to cooperate with that spirit. Now, something interesting came out of the matter in connection. You remember first century martyr Stephen was stoned to death. But before he did, he gave probably one of the strongest, uh, most forceful speeches or witness before those opposing Jews. And in that, he said something that is helpful to us if we see it in the right perspective as we assume and play our role in this matter of working out our salvation. Now let's take a look at that in Acts chapter 7 and what he states there at verse number 51 to them and of course he states it uh, negatively in a way that uh, was a condemnation for them but when looked at properly we uh, use the principle to help us Acts 751 now he says to them obstinate men and uncircumcised in hearts and ears you are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your forefathers did so you do so now he put the finger really on what their problem was that led to this. That not only had they earlier uh, murdered or put to, death, put to death the Christ, but now they are about to pounce on him and put him to death. And he said, here the problem is with, with you people and it was with your forefathers. You're always going in the opposite direction that Jehovah's Spirit is trying to lead you or take you. Now, the Holy Spirit does its job 
because it's by means of his spirit that Jehovah is doing the teaching and the instructing and helping us. For example, we assemble at a meeting here. We're under Jehovah's spirit. As we were singing a little earlier, uh, his spirit is here with us to see that we get the instruction. We're sitting under that spirit. And so it flows to us. It gives us his teaching. But now, what he told them is, notwithstanding, you're always going the opposite direction. You know where the Spirit is leading you, and you deliberately resist it and go the other way. Consequences? Well, he said you are uncircumcised in hearts. You are uncircumcised in ears. Let's talk about those two things. That's our role. Uh, following the leadings of Jehovah's Spirit then require us to act in a way and in harmony with what this is actually to accomplish in our life. Circumcision of the heart. We're talking about a spiritual circumcision. And the spiritual circumcision of the heart places on us a responsibility that we can work out, of course, with fear and trembling, but God is in there helping us. Now, our studies of the heart uh, has helped us to appreciate that uh, when scripturally and here and other places we talk about the heart, we mean this figurative heart that really embraces all that we are inside. Uh, it's the interior man. It sums up the total of everything we are inside. The secret person of the heart, the man we are inside, however you want to put it. The sum total of everything you know you are inside, but others do not necessarily know. At least not all of that. So then, if we are to play our role in working out our own salvation, then we don't want to be like those first century Jewish persons who stoned Stephen and who rejected Christ and thus remain uncircumcised in heart. That means you're not doing what you should be doing with that spiritual heart. You're not working on the interior like you should. Working on the interior then means we have to be concerned about all our desires, our imaginations, thoughts, our passions, our reasonings, our affections, our emotions, our memory, our activities. In other words, all of these things come forth from the heart. And the circumcising of it means that we are actually taking the time to uh, cut away what we identify scripturally and determine to be bad or injurious. And that's what they wouldn't do. In the face of the scriptures and knowing what the prophecy said and understanding the direction that God was leading them, they went the other way. So God gives us this important role of continuing to look at what we are inside. Working out our own salvation means cooperating with God's spirit, and working on removing what is injurious to Jehovah. Now, here is how one uh, little point in the Watchtower, but I liked it. I'm just going to quote what it said on that. And it made the point that we, we need to do this. And then it said, we need to aggressively remove corrosive elements that may linger in the recesses of our figurative. Let's read that again. It was good enough to hear it twice. We need to aggressively, so that gives us a thought, it's not laid back or casually, aggressively remove corrosive elements that may linger in the recesses of our figurative heart. So in other words, that the cleaning needs to be thorough. And our purpose in studying the scriptures 
that give us the mind of Christ and the direction of God's Holy Spirit is to identify what there is injurious. And then when we identify it, it says aggressively, get it out, remove it. Don't let it stay there. Problems can result if you let it stay there. Now, it doesn't have to be something so catastrophic that would require removing a person from God's clean organization. But it's certainly going to do damage if left there. And I want to read you something this sister said. First, she talked a little about her circumstance. Then she gets down to this. She says, there's one thing that really bothers me, brothers, and that is my husband looks at other women. Now, he says it is not intentional, but he just notices them and checks them out in order to compare with others to see which woman looks the best. He says he just looks at them because they look good. Sure, you're going to notice a beautiful woman, but I don't think it's right to keep noticing her just because she looks good. Yeah, sometimes I see a nice looking guy, but I don't, I don't just stare at him and look at his assets as my husband does other women. Brothers, I just have a lot of anger inside me right now whether it's a girl on the street, in a car, on the road, or anywhere we go, he takes note of women. It's like he's obsessed with them, getting some type of stimulation when he looks at them. He even listens to music on the radio that deals with a lot of sex and stuff. This has been going on ever since we started dating. I've worried over this so much I've lost 55 pounds. I don't know if it's jealousy or not. I've tried everything in the world just to look good for him, but I'm failing. Please write me back and tell me what I ought to do. Whose problem? Is it? Oh, well, she's making herself sick, yes. Emotionally, she's not holding up very well. But who has something in the recesses of that figurative heart that needs to aggressively be identified and removed? Now, a good reason this comes up because more than a few times, I'll just put it that way, I've heard some of our sisters say, something like this. You know, when I'm around brother so-and-so, I just feel very uncomfortable. It's like, they say, it's the way he's looking at me. I'm not comfortable with that. And it seems even at times, and then they describe maybe uh, other overtures, Now, what's happening? Why should Christian sisters feel uncomfortable? Is it inappropriate looking? Now, here's just one poor sister, uh, uh, Mary, and she had only been married, I think she said here, three months. A lot of problems in that little time, but the point is, somebody had something they should be working on. Somebody should have been working on what was injurious. Someone should have been aggressively trying to remove that corrosive element in the heart. And even though at this time she was uh, writing about her problem, there was apparently nothing overt that could be done. But that's what we're talking about, working out your own salvation. 
that can be done. See, that is not something out of the imperfect human's ability and scope to do. Would not doing it be an accomplishment? Let's just take his case and narrow it to there. But, of course, wherever the inappropriate looking or roving eye or whatever it was exists, well, that should be an accomplishment. We're working out our own salvation. Jehovah expects us to make an accomplishment. That's something that can be done. That's something that should be done. That's part of our role even as imperfect, to identify and honestly acknowledge if there exists a corrosive element. Now, whose fault is it if a person allows something like that to trip them up on the way to salvation? Not Jehovah God. He gives the direction by means of the Spirit. He encourages us to be... Uh, honest with ourselves and strive to make progress, to make accomplishments. That's what it means, working out our own salvation, we have to be responsive to it. Now this includes even more deeply ingrained uh, habits. Some of these are a little bit more difficult to deal with. Uh, let me read you what this sister said. She's talking about herself. Dear brothers, my reason for writing you is due to a very personal problem that I've had for years. It's now starting to crowd out my joy in service to Jehovah. The problem is, as I see it, I have a very strong sexual drive. I quit my secular job a few months ago and I began regular pioneering. That's brought me much joy and it has served to calm down my desires to a degree. However, I had to resume work a little while back, and the problem has begun to increase again. Lately, I have been going through a very vicious cycle. The desires trigger off disgusting thoughts. The thoughts cause feelings of loneliness and depression, and then frustration, and finally, worthlessness and guilt. Sadly, believe it or not, I try very hard to pray before the desires get intense and to control my thoughts, to keep my mind occupied with spiritual things. This is my constant prayer, and I try to discuss only wholesome things with others. Brothers, I don't want to commit fornication. I don't want to start dating an unbeliever, and I don't want to fall into the habit of self-abuse which I practiced before learning the truth. As each month goes by, I get more and more frustrated with these desires and the lack of an outlet. I am very active and busy, working a secular job, regular pioneering, trying hard to keep up with preparing for congregation meetings and necessary secular matters, house cleaning, attending to personal needs, and so forth. All of these provide a full schedule for me. I try very hard to be a woman of prayer and to seek Jehovah's help at all times, though I know that I can improve greatly. If you have any suggestions or thoughts that can help me, I will be very happy to receive them. Brothers, please help me. Well, there's an honest admission. There's a problem. This is different from the other. The other was more uh, deliberate. Uh, allowing something corrosive to stay there. Here is something that may be more deeply ingrained. We don't know. You can't say. We know imperfection is very serious. It can make life very difficult. But whatever the case here then, why is it worth continuing to do what she says here she's doing, keeping busy and active and praying to Jehovah and fighting against this weakness. Very simply, it's worth it because even though she may not overcome this and it go away forever and never bother her again, 
her continued effort to strive against this and bring the measure of control that she possibly can is going to lessen the propensity and the inclination to act on any of those thoughts. And that's why one should continue striving against it. Because as long as it is left there unchecked and nobody is fighting to deal with this or to curb it or to take all the spiritual provision that Jehovah makes for us to counteract it, then its strength remains great. But when one is diligent and deciduous and determined, I'm going to use the provisions Jehovah makes to fight against this. His spirit is acting within me to help me to do this. I'm not going to give in to it. If it flares up and becomes very strong, I'm going to just fight harder at this. Because if it's not overcome, at least the fight against it is going to be less. And you see, Jehovah in his great wisdom understands this type of problem. Now, this is just one we're mentioning. We could name five or six others in the same category, but she was so honest, I felt it would be worthwhile. Here's someone you know she's struggling to try uh, to bring her life in harmony with what Jehovah God says. But this point was made in the Watchtower. I thought it would be worth reading. And even the subheading just right away went to our heart because the subheading here said, Jehovah believes in you. Right to the heart. And then a few comments were made. It says, so Jehovah knows what negative tendencies you struggle against whether you inherited them or acquired them as a result of other influences beyond your control. He understands exactly how these have affected you. He understands your limitations even better than you yourself do. And this is the good part. He is merciful. He never expects more of us how God is acting uh, within us. He let us know it's for his good pleasure. Jehovah believes in you. It is his good pleasure to work within you and take that major role to lead you on to salvation. And that should give us every incentive and every reason, one, not to give in to a temptation, not to buckle up under a trial, not to go against what he says and taking a course of least resistance, but to continue to leave ourselves in his hand and under his care. But at the same time, doing our part, to work out our own salvation. See, that's a fundamental we must have in mind in this matter of everlasting life. That Jehovah believes in you. And he understands all the ramifications in every aspect of any problem any one of us might have. But he does not let that turn him back to trying to help us to work out our own salvation with him taking the lead and the major role while we at the same time acknowledge his special role and with fear and trembling we strive to work out our own salvation so this matter then of not resisting the spirit the spirit that is always at work in us and to understand that here is a God that's working with us that he wants us to get there. It is for his good pleasure that he's helping us along to everlasting life. And while he gives us these uh, intermediate uh, goals that we can accomplish, we can do and encourage us along, 
then we have to see it that we're working along with someone who really wants to see us get there. And it's just our part, see, in working out what we are inside, or as Stephen said it, uh, seeing that our heart is circumcised in a spiritual sense, that we're cleaning up the interior man, making it the best we can, but even when we get to hard problems, difficult things like this, uh, we don't give up because we see, yes, this may stay as a problem. Imperfection will do that with many things. Some things we will not clear up until sometime in the millennium. But that doesn't mean we're disqualified because we've got something there deeply ingrained, something that is habitual, something that flares up time to time or is somewhat consistent, in no way means he's not working with us. He still believes in us. He wants us there. And he's going to help us to get to that. He believes in us. He knows us. When he got involved to play this major role with us in getting everlasting life, he knew we were dust then. But he's determined if we do our part in our role that he's going to get us there and that he will take his proper role in working out our own salvation. Now, another point you remember that uh, Stephen mentioned there and not resisting the spirit and remaining uncircumcised in heart and ears. So what's he talking about there? Well, that's an important idea, too. Uh, This matter of seeing that we are circumcised in ear. Now, simply put, that means that we are removing any obstruction to being responsive to what Jehovah says. In other words, Jehovah is teaching us by means of his spirit. And if there's anything about us that is acting to block or obstruct our accepting and responding to that, then that's where it's a the cutting away or removing whatever that obstacle is. What could interfere? Pride could. Some people are like that, spirit of independence. Sometimes that dominates the person. Uh, Sometimes they chafe under uh, counsel or direction that Jehovah sends with his light of truth through the organization. And they want to go another way. That's what Stephen was pointing out to those uh, Jews who rejected him and rejected Jesus. He said, you're always resisting. You see the way Jehovah's Spirit is flowing. So here it's letting us know, identify if there is anything that is an obstruction or blocking you from responding and doing what Jehovah says. It's a matter of pride or independence or self-will. All of these things exist in the world or just not wanting someone uh, telling you what to do if there's a tendency with any of these things and it's saying remove that because we have to have clear hearing spiritually in order to respond to what Jehovah is saying so he focused on these two things the interior the man we are inside the secret person of the heart the sum total of everything we are inside but then he got to this external and he says you, you can't have a problem there something is blocking your response, not Jehovah's teaching, uh, not properly having the direction and counsel brought our way, but to our actually responding to and doing it. That's what was good about these Philippians. Uh, Go back there now to chapter 2, because I want to just point out here uh, what he said in the same verse we read earlier, but now why he was happy with them in this matter of... uh, their response. Verse 12, we discussed quite a bit the latter part, but notice at the beginning, Paul says, "In consequently, my beloved ones, in the way that you have always obeyed. See, so he picks that out. You're an obedient type. 
uh, you're not allowing an obstruction to following through in what he said. And of course, here when he encouraged them that they needed to uh, keep working out their own salvation with fear and trembling, then he went on at verse 15 to sum up his argument and says, that you may come to be blameless and innocent children of God without a blemish in among a crooked and twisted generation among whom you are shining as illuminators in the world, keeping a tight grip on the word of life that I may have cause for exaltation in Christ's day that I did not run in vain or work hard. So that's what was bringing him this great joy that he could, one, give them the encouragement their situation was not easy. Help them to understand that, well, yes, we all must keep obeying what God says, responding to it, but that you have here a major role to keep working out your own salvation, allowing God's spirit that has a higher role to give you the direction. And then he gave it a lofty, Meaning, he says, so that in and among this crooked and twisted generation where you have all these pressures and possible trials all around you, he said, you can shine as a luminous. He says, that's going to reinforce what you preach. Uh, that's going to help others that you talk to, where you live, where you work, where you go to school, where you live, uh, in a neighborhood or what have you, because they're going to see... Not perfection in you, but that you're trying real hard and that here Jehovah is helping you and working uh, with you. And then he says, nothing is going to make me happier than uh, in Christ's day there will be this cause uh, for joy and exaltation. And the reason is because it was a productive work. It was a work not done in vain. It was a work that brought results. It was finally going to bring people to the fulfillment of their goal to have eternal life. And that's what we have to keep in mind, uh, brothers, as a perspective. The enduring of the obstacles, the trials, the temptations, the pressures, or whatever this system brings against us is one thing. But we have to keep ever mindful that we're working with something stronger and more powerful and that here within us, God's Spirit is always at work, never stops, trying to get us to want to, uh, to be glad to, and to keep going in spite of all these things because it can happen in our own instance and in our own case. And that at the end of this is really an actuality the matter of being saved. And certainly still immediately ahead of us is a great tribulation. Our salvation, for the most part, will come as a result of a rescue. If we're rescued alive from the greatest tribulation that uh, ever strikes this earth. And how grand it's going to be when that day happens for you. When finally this present system, wicked world, is removed and you find yourself standing in God's name. And then all of these fights and trials and pressures and difficulties will have been well worth it to go through because we then will see the fulfillment and that's brought about by God. And that will show it was worth our while to keep making accomplishments Keep working on ourselves, particularly the inside, because that's what God is carefully looking at. That's where he assesses his judgment, and that's why he gives us the encouragement, deal with reality, work on what's there. You can do that, not perfectly. He understands, yes, there will be things there, but we'll take you to the other side, and that's why there is a thousand years to keep working at because some of the things will take considerable effort on our part. But it can be done. And what a day of exaltation that will be when we finally can claim that reward as our own and find ourselves implanted in uh, God's new world. And 
and all of this because he would not let us give up. He caused us to want to and to be glad to keep working in that direction into our day. Thus, for all of us, is the constant encouragement, even exhortation. Keep working out your own salvation, but doing so with fear and trouble. His theme is going to be, do you recognize the power of wrong desire? So we're going to turn our attention now to Brother Brown. I'd like to greet all of you first and tell you it's a pleasure to see you again. I was just thinking it's been a couple years that passed since I actually came right here uh, into Boston. It's always a thrill for us to do so. So we're very glad to be here this evening to see all of you and to have this opportunity to have this special uh, Saturday evening uh, meeting. So I think the congregation here is Franklin Field, though it appears to be almost anybody <laughs> as I look around, but it's very fine to see everyone and uh, to have this occasion to examine some things scripturally this evening. We're all doing fine at Bethel. Everybody you know there that I saw said, tell you hello uh, when I got here. So if you just could accept that uh, general greeting from all that you know there that saw me when they knew I was coming up here, they said pass along their loving greetings, as well as I'll do it for the whole Bethel family. So you'll have the loving greetings of all. Now, as mentioned uh, this evening, our theme is a question. Uh, do you recognize the power of wrong desire? And it's a good question here to really think about, uh, meditate on, and contemplate, because there seems to be a problem with many in underestimating wrong desire's power. And, of course, to miscalculate in this area can be life-threatening. So we have to know what we're up against. And this is why that question is suitable and it's asked on a personal basis. Do you recognize how potent wrong desires are? Do you recognize the strength of their power. Now, just to get us thinking about it, let's examine the matter scripturally and historically from this point of view. That when you take it through the Bible, you can see over and over again that imperfect humans, like ourselves, underestimated its power and it put them in a life-threatening situation. Now, let's go back to the mother of all of us, Eve. And she was perfect. But look in your Bible there in Genesis chapter 3. And we can see here what led to her demise and how she finally did succumb to wrong desire. Now, in her case, the wrong desire was to be independent of God to have more freedom than what God allowed for. Take a look at chapter 3. Now, start at verse 6. That's the one I'd like to read. And you pick out what uh, led to this. Consequently, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was something to be longed for to the eye. Yes, the tree was desirable to look upon. So she began taking of its fruit and eating it. Afterwards, she gave some also to her husband, went with her, and he began eating it. Now, you notice where we place the emphasis, and this shows her point of view. No wrong. Something desirable. No wrong. And then it gave us the result. 
That desire became so potent, so powerful, she went and ate from it. Afterward, she gave some to her husband. He followed her in it, and we know the result. We're all feeling it today. The penalty was death, and they both paid it. That was 6,000 years ago. And she's still dead today. <laughs> and will remain dead forever. Now, it's certainly a powerful something that can take you on a course that affects your eternal life prospects. But it was all because she looked at it as something desirable, something to be longed for, and it was wrong. And she finally succumbed to it. Now, this is not just a matter confined to our terrestrial environment. There were problems in the heaven with this. Get chapter 6. And the matter started to... Bread. We go to the time of Noah. Uh, now, what was wrong here, from the point of view of these angelic creatures, was sexual desires. Look at verse 1. Now, it came about when men started to grow in numbers on the surface of the ground, and daughters were born to them. Then the sons of the true God began to notice the daughters of men, that they were good-looking. And they went taking wives for themselves, namely all whom they chose. That was wrong. Sexuality was not to exist in heaven. That was something earthly. But as the report said, these spirit angelic sons of God, they began to view women folk uh, the same as men folk did. And so they started to develop passion and sexual desire. For them, it was a perversion. It was a distortion. They were not created to be that way. But you see, they started desiring what uh, there was wrong. And we know what happened. They came down and they married these women so they could enjoy sexual experience. While abnormal for them, their desire for it pushed them to leave the heavens, come to this earth, and participate in wrong. The penalty, well, the flood didn't wipe them out when shortly after uh, this it came. It wiped out humans, but uh, the spirit sons of God were able to dematerialize and uh, they were going back into their original realm, but God put them in a prison in the heavens. In darkness, as far as his spiritual light is concerned. And they had to remain there. They could not enter the realm and access to God that they had previously had. That's where they are now. But they're not happy there. Because they're waiting for one day to their surprise. That soon in which they're going to be destroyed. And put out of existence. All because they gave in to that uh, desire of sexual greed. Now, we could go on and on with these examples. That's why it's good the scriptures record them. Uh, what about David? While a faithful man of God, we know the problem he got in when it came to Bathsheba, the wife of another, adulterous leanings, build up a passionate wrong desire for the wife of another, and then promptly acted thereon. And look at the personal tragedies he had to face as a result of it. Or what about Achan? 
There was a man who allowed his desire for gold, silver, good-looking garment to cause him to become a thief, stealing from God, spoils of war, off-limits, God had said. He stole the material. And we know the consequences. It cost him and his whole family. And when he described uh, just what moved him to do it, quoting from Scripture, he said, When I got to see among the spoil a garment from Shinar, a good-looking one, and 200 shekels of silver and one gold bar, 50 shekels being its weight, then I wanted them, and I took them. See, he was being moved by the desire for what was material, gold, silver, and good-looking garment. We know the result. He and his whole family were destroyed by God. Judas was another thief. He had been stealing money from the official treasury that Jesus and the other apostles kept to help the poor. That way he had his hands in there taking it. And then finally he committed, as we know, the most wicked, dastardly act in human history to betray Jehovah God's Son. And his words were at the time very simply, what will you give me to betray him? See, what could I get? That greed had set in uh, to get more. So we have many desires uh, in the scripture that are wrong in persons who succumb to them. So there's no doubt when you look the course of human history, perfection, Adam and Eve, in the spiritual realm, the sons of God, imperfection, all of the rest here in the earth, we see there was a common denominator that what was wrong could be enticing and could be so powerful as to move men to sin and some of them to their permanent ruin. All right, you say that's historically. What does it have to do with us today, all of these years later? It has a lot because, really, no one has figured out entirely how to make themselves immune from these wrong desires that crop up. And because of this, uh, organizationally, we suffer tragic losses each year uh, by those who give in to wrong desires. Uh, back in the Watchtower, January 1, 1986, we reviewed it a couple times in the uh, day's text this year already, but I'd like to just read that again. It's that important. It shows where we are now. It's up to date. But in paragraph 12, it says, shocking as it is, even some who have been prominent in Jehovah's organization have succumbed to immoral practices, including homosexuality, wife swapping, and child molesting. It is to be noted also that during the past year, 36,008 individuals had to be disfellowshipped from the Christian congregation. The greater number of them for practicing immorality. Jehovah's organization must be kept clean. This is a time for congregation elders, ministerial servants, and indeed all our brothers and sisters to avoid any circumstances that could lead to immorality. So we see the emphasis was trying to say, well, look what's happened to so many. Now that was the preceding service year, not the one we just got out of, but we were even more startled when we read the figure just last month that even more had to be this fellowship the year after. You would have felt people would have read this and said, 
Over 36,000. I better check up on myself and watch myself. This is getting at a lot of people. But then we found even more. 37,436 had to go out the last year. Two years, and we're talking about over 73,000 people that had to be disfellowshipped because they had gone too far. Now, just expanding it a little, and this is the invisible realm of this. We're not given the figure of those who did similarly and had to come before committees and they were reproved privately. You don't know necessarily who they are. You know the number that had to be reproved publicly in your area that was announced to you. But now when you start adding all of this up, we're looking at hundreds of thousands, aren't we? And we're only talking about those who, because of going so far, had to in some way be disciplined. But as the Watchtower said, Jehovah's organization must be kept clean. And it said it's the time for all to avoid any circumstances that could lead to immorality. See, because the idea is it seems many will go too far in that direction before recovering. Thus action has to be taken. But the situation can even look worse. Because even as we talk about this now, there's some in serious trouble. Not that they've done anything, but they're struggling with something right now. And the figures that we have given that uh, recorded those who in the past few years got in such difficulty that they had to be cut off, or the unknown figure, as far as publicizing it, that uh, had to be handled uh, judicially, can perhaps in time even take in others because there are many who are in trouble. They're sincere, they're honest, they love Jehovah, they want to do what's right. But you see, there are these desires that they do not have under the control they should. And unless these are brought under a control, problems are ahead for some now. Now, the illustrated, I brought a few uh, letters along. We get letters. The friends write us at the society. They write the society and they seek help with their problems. And some of these are very serious problems, struggling, people are going through, they want help, they want to know what to do, they get help locally, get encouragement, but they're still not really in control as they should. Uh, this one is from a sister. She writes to society, dear brothers, in a little background, I'm going to get to the pertinent excerpts. She says, my problem for writing is due to a personal matter that I've had to face for years that's now beginning to crowd out my joy in service. The problem is a very strong sex drive. I've noticed, however, that in the last five or six years, the problem has become increasingly worse tightening even in the past two years. Now, I'm not a youth. I'm 33 years old, and I'm a regular pioneer for the past few years, and I've been endeavoring to serve Jehovah and allow the full-time service to calm down my desires, and it's helped to a degree. But I still have not controlled these. I've approached some of the elders and talked to them. I even had a medical examination, but I've not resolved matters as yet. 
I want to be able to serve Jehovah whole soul and full time as a single sister and to enjoy singleness, not just endure it. But I get very frustrated because of not being able to control these desires. Is there anything you know I can do that will help me to cope with these better? Please help me, your sister. And then she signs her name. Now, here's another one. Dear brothers, the problem now I'm having is strong sexual drive and attraction that uh, I'm really not sure of how to describe. It has nothing to do with mutual attraction to someone of the opposite sex. But because this drive is constant, I have not attended meetings in a long time. It happens when I'm sitting or standing. Rarely is there a day that passes that I do not feel this reaction manifest in some way. So, can you please tell me what's wrong? Can you tell me, brothers, what's happening to me? So, brothers, if you can, please help me in this depressed, dark despair I feel. I'm counting on your advice. Thank you very much, your sister. Now, here's another one. She says, dear watchtower, then she goes on. Uh, my problem is sex. I always thought that I didn't really understand how deep these negative feelings were inside of me and how I really hurt and feel confused by these feelings that continue to take place. I don't think I can deal with it any longer by myself. I need someone who I can go to and cry and get it out, who would understand me and let me express myself. Sometimes even when I pray, my mind wanders on sex. Even in the meetings, my warm mind has wandered on to sex. Am I just no good? And then she signs it. Uh, here's one more. This is from a brother. I'm writing you this letter out of my strong desire to mold my life to complete adherence with Jehovah's ways. The problem is that I have a tremendous need for a male, both emotionally and physically. I keep praying for Jehovah to help me see men and women in the proper light and to give me endurance. It is a matter of constant prayer. Shamefully, I must admit, and I've told this to the elders, that I fall prey to self-abuse often, which I know is affecting my relationship with Jehovah, and I hate myself for it. I am sometimes successful in fighting it off, but inevitably I stumble into this terrible habit again. My situation seems so hopeless, and yet I know others have been successful in overcoming this. What can I do? And then he sighs. And these are just a few. There are a few of the honest ones struggling, seeking help, trying to overcome improper and wrong desires and yet becoming frustrated by it. So the point we ought to have in mind, every single one of us, is what can we really do to fortify ourselves to be able to cope with whatever it is that comes along and deal effectively with wrong desires. That's why we presented the question, 
Do you recognize the power of wrong desires? Do you see what they can do to people, people serving God? Do you see what they're doing to people who are struggling to keep serving God, who want to do what's right, but at the same time find the going extremely difficulty? Well, now to help ourselves, let's raise a few questions and then answer them uh, with the idea of saying on an individual basis, what can I do to fortify myself, to help myself, to be able to cope with what must be coped with? So I don't somewhere along the line just end up a statistic. Another one who tried for life but could not hold out and endure it. Because the only ones who are going to finally end up with life are those who learn how to successfully cope with the challenges. Coming to meetings and preaching and reading and studying, while vitally important, will not offset a course of immorality or to stumble into carrying out some wrong desire. So let's see what needs to be understood and what can be done. Now, first, we ask this. Why do you say it is necessary to recognize the power of wrong desire? Now, very likely a number of things that come to your mind. But now, let me suggest this answer and probably this is what first came to your mind. We need to recognize wrong desires power because they can lead to us committing some overt act or sin. In other words, we're saying if the wrong desire is there, then there is the possibility that it is going to trigger in us wrong conduct. Or, putting it another way, if the wrong desire is there, we say, then it can take root and cause us to commit some overt act or sin. Displease God and lose his favor. So you say, that is a reason we should recognize wrong desire's power. And that's absolutely right. That's a good reason. We ought to recognize it for that. But, you know, I want to suggest even a more impelling reason. I mentioned the obvious first, uh, but sometimes what is not as obvious or apparent can be very helpful to us, too. Now, this reason we'd like to suggest here goes all the way back to when Jehovah was dealing with Israel and he gave them the law, that Mosaic law, including the Ten Commandments. And it was, in fact, one of those commandments. So turn there in your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And uh, there in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have presented the Ten Commandments. And you know them. God warned uh, his people there what not to do. And as you look them over, you see he tells them they're not to steal. They're not to murder anybody. They're not to commit adultery. But now, we're interested in the last commandment, the tenth one, and that's found in verse 21. Now, notice what God rules out here. He says, neither must you desire your fellow man's wife, neither must you selfishly crave your fellow man's house, his field, or his slave man, or his slave girl, his bull, or his ass, or anything that belongs to your fellow man. Question, what did this tenth commandment outlaw? The desire for what was wrong. See, the ones ahead had already outlawed stealing. You couldn't do that. It had already outlawed adultery. So they knew they were not to commit these overt wrongs. But now, when Jehovah got to number 10, he made it a law to even desire anything wrong. 
In other words, he says here that if you imagine sin, that is sinful. He, in effect, says you do not have to carry out what is avert, the conduct or the wrong behavior. But he says the imagination of sin is sinful. Now, why did Jehovah God make that a law? Nobody could enforce it. The human judges, how would they know what was on a person's mind and heart? They couldn't read it. So why did Jehovah God make it a law that if you desire what is wrong, that that in itself is a sin and sinful, whether you carry it out or not? Because it was to act as a restraint. It was to let them know that they were dealing primarily with God. And true, humans couldn't enforce it, but God would know about it. And he would enforce it in some way in their lives. So to let them understand how terribly powerful wrong desires could be, he made even the imagination of sin sinful. So that a person couldn't say, well, I didn't carry it out. I didn't commit what was avert, so I'm still on the safe side. No, God knew if they had allowed to develop a selfish craving for what was someone else's, that they had sinned already. And that even if they could boast and say that they did not go and take physically their neighbor's wife and commit adultery. If they had lustful desires for her and had built up this craving for her passionately, they were already judged by God as guilty. So, you see, God recognized that wrong desires were so powerful and that humans would tend to feel, well, as long as I didn't do anything, I'm on the safe side. And they might just mull these things over in mind and heart to enjoy some titillating experience. Or as they say today, some thrill, some little passionate desire. Because they understood that even that was condemned and wrong by God that that should restrain them from allowing these things to get in mind and heart and they would throw it out of mind and heart right away because if they knew God was real and involved then they would not take the liberty of allowing these wrong things in mind and heart and if they didn't do that then you see they wouldn't be on the first step to allowing wrong desire to reach in there with its power and potency and make them carry out what was avert so under the law arrangement with his people the tenth commandment that God gave outlawed wrong desire now, someone might just say, well, we're not under the Mosaic law. We're now under Christ. We're under undeserved kindness, mercy, and love. Didn't that go out? The Ten Commandments were done away with in the rest of the Mosaic law. So we're not under some type of scrutiny such as this from God, are we, they say? Uh, the way some would act, you would think. <laughs> that they felt that was true but no uh, when Jesus they explained the doing away with the law and his uh, great sermon there on the mount he took the same principle and saw to it that it was incorporated into Christianity and you know his words when he said he that keeps on looking at a woman so as to have a lust for her a desire for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That principle remains. It was John who said what? Whoever hates his brother is a... What? Uh, a what? A hater of his brother? 
What did he say? Is what? Whoever hates his brother is a what? Who recall? Yes. Yeah. A manslayer. So you didn't have to go and carry it out. That's the point. See, the logical thing to say, whoever uh, hates his brother is a brother hater. <laughs> but it said no. You see, that hatred, that animosity, that hostility leads to murder. So he said, whoever would have that in, he's going to be judged not as just a hater of his brother. He's going to be judged as a manslayer. So uh, this same principle was carried over to Christianity. We're all under this arrangement, too, which means if we're going to recognize how necessary it is to deal uh, effectively with wrong desires, we have to see this principle, that we cannot take what is wrong, even though it may be appealing to us, and enjoy it in mind and heart, feeling I'm on the safe side, just imagining sin, but not carrying it out. The imagination of sin is sinful, and God judges it. And it's to our benefit to have this principle in mind. And I'm sure if you could trace back the many people who get into difficulties and give in to wrong desires, they were thinking similarly. They were thinking, as long as I do not act this out or take steps to do this, I'm still on the safe side. Oh, yes, they say, I know I should not be thinking about it, but there is, as the scriptures say, some enjoyment in sin. <laughs> thinking about it in that way. So, we have two reasons why it's so necessary to recognize wrong desire's power. Because, one, it leads to wrong acts. And two, even if it doesn't, the desire itself God views as sin and will judge that and make known his judgment of it in the lives of the persons who feel at liberty to enjoy in mind and heart what is wrong. Now, we raise the next question, then, to help us. Now, what is the source of these wrong desires? Where do they come from? Who's to blame? Here we are, 6,000 years deep in imperfection, and we all feel this pressure. So we need to understand, what's the source of them? Where do they come from? Who's to blame? Because if we don't know this, we really don't know where to begin. And the interesting thing about this, if you just start asking different people these uh, questions, they give different answers, which shows there is some confusion about it. Some people, as you know, they want to blame it all on the devil. And certainly he comes in for his share. Others say it's the world we live in, the environment that surrounds us. And then in our day and time, it's become popular to say, sin? What's that? Nobody's to blame. And then even when they try to pin blame, they say, well, it's always somebody else. It's not you. Don't ever blame yourself. Is somebody else. So, you see, there is confusion today when you talk to people as, where do these things start? What are their source? And who are you going to blame? Now, that's why we're very glad we do not have to guess at this. We have specific direction. And let's open to the uh, book of James. Now, this is where our discussion will uh, center around. So get that first chapter. And we want to focus now on a uh, specific answer here uh, that's going to help us now. Uh, James chapter 1. Now, would you please follow as I read verse 14 and then I'll read 15. This is a key text, so 
follow each word. It says, but each one is tried by being drawn out and enticed by his own desire. Then the desire, when it has become fertile, gives birth to sin. In turn, sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. Now, I read the answer, and I gave emphasis to the words. It said very clearly there who you are to blame. And there was no way to miss the point. It says it is his own desire. So when you start looking for blame, don't hold a finger out like that. See, we have to turn it like that. See, it's you right here. Each one of us, my, that's where you have to start. Now, that's not popular today, as we alluded to a few minutes ago. Today, you see, the world says, uh, sink the guilt trip. See, in other words, they don't want people feeling guilty over what they're doing uh, that's wrong, so they try to make them feel, well, even though you're doing wrong, uh, have a good feeling and conscience about it. Or as they say, you can't help yourself. <laughs> so don't get upset and worried because you've got this problem. And do you know they pay people well to tell them that? <laughs> Professionals they go to. So there he goes. He's got some problem. So he heads for the psychologist to get at the bottom of it. So the psychologist sits him down to analyze him. He says, tell me a little about your background. He says, well, he said, I think it was rather normal. I can't think of anything uh, outstanding in it. Well, it must be something. Let's go back. What about your mother? Did she love you? <laughs> now they're probing deeply. He says, well, she, I think, was a very good mother. She seemed to care about me and the other. Well, did she ever tell you anything unusual happened while she was carrying you, while she was pregnant with you? No, well, I can't think of anything she ever meant. Oh, she did tell me once that while she was carrying me, she was caught in a rainstorm. Uh, he said, that's it. That's why you're such a drip. He said, you can't really help yourself. That's the whole thing there. What can you do about it? That started things off. So you drop off $75 with the receptionist. And so he leaves happy. See, because now, whatever he calls his problem, he feels, I just can't help myself. My mama was caught in a rainstorm. <laughs> So the world would like us to believe, you see, we can't do anything about this. And it's by design now. They want people to think you're hopeless. So you just do what you got to do. But that's not what the scriptures tell us. He very clearly said there, it is his own desire. You cannot blame it on Satan. You cannot blame it on the environment. You cannot blame it on the association. You cannot blame it on the demons. You cannot blame it on the world, heredity, even your mother. You've got to say this is where the blame belongs, primarily. That's the source of wrong desires. The inducement to sin is this inner reaction and response perhaps to other things but you see it starts here all these other things can be contributing factors and we're not ruling them out but if we're going to get down to solutions to problems we must deal with ourselves and that's what he tells us there we've got to work on ourselves individually 
Now, I said individually. Yes, look back at that verse. Now, I want you to look at how he opened it up. He said, but each one. Now, we start to get somewhere. See, he had said there, as we talked about, own desire. But now he opens up, but each one. See, has his own desire there. In other words, now he's letting us know that each one of us is a little bit different. Uh, each one of us has his own peculiarities. In other words, each one of us has a certain moral nature. We have our own eccentricities. We have our own idiosyncrasies. We have our moral makeup. Now, while similar, because we're all imperfect and it's all bad, we don't all have the same mix. In other words, what is a weakness to one person may be a strength to another. Uh, it's just like our fingerprints. Now, to the casual, untrained eye, we all might have one that looks pretty much the same when they ink the thumb and take the print of it and you just look at it, they all look similar. But those who study this say everybody has a different one that you don't find two alike. So it's the same with our moral makeup. It's the same with the mix uh, in our uh, temperament and makeup and peculiarities. So. When he tells us each one, and then links that with own desire, he's in effect telling us we've got to find out now where is our problem. Now, for example, uh, let's take the problem of food. Now, have you ever met a person like this? They actually eat very little. You had them over your house, you fixed your best meal, and you passed everything. They just took a little, put it on their plate, and they ate that. They didn't even take some of all of it. So you said, no, go ahead, you're welcome, help yourself. I said, oh, no, I've had really all I want. I'm happy. I'm not a big eater. I just eat a little. And you wonder, now, are they really saying the right thing? Do they really enjoy this? And they assure you, no, that's just the way I am. I just eat a little. I'm happy. I enjoyed it, but it just doesn't take a lot for me. then very clearly then that person uh, isn't going to have a problem with gluttony. They're not going to have a problem with overeating because their natural inclination is just to get a little of it. They know how much you got there and they know how good it is. But they only eat a little. Maybe you know people like that. Maybe you like that. They're not even up to average eaters, but they only want a little. So no matter what you fix and no matter how much you have, it's no temptation for them. They're not going to overeat and they're never going to end up being a glutton for food. On the other hand, <laughs> there are persons when you, you've got your table spread and you invited them over and when they walk in the room they're grinning and... <laughs> I mean to use the uh, current vernacular they're really into food uh, and the smile is there and they're sniffing the aromas are going and now you sit down you start passing 
and they're just talking and smiling. And as you pass each place, they take a nice, generous portion. Now, they're discreet. <laughs> because they know as a Christian they should not be overeating. But, you know, each little thing comes by, they put it there, and then they look around and they decide, well, would it be appropriate to uh, go back again? And if that seems appropriate, then they, well, would you pass me that again? And, and all the time they're talking about how good it is and the flavors, they can comment on it, everything, and you really feel good because you say they are enjoying this. Now, we could say that person could be tempted to overeat, and maybe they know it. See, food's a problem with them. Uh, they probably have to, at times, not eat all they'd like. And when you have everything fixed just right, it's so enjoyable that there is that little temptation to go back again and again. That's why we had that watchtower back May 1 over a year ago. Just a little caution, but people had been writing the society and they were saying, you put people out for smoking cigarettes, but I know a lot who overeat. <laughs> That's the summation of what they all were saying. Why don't you check up on some of these, they said, that are eating too much. <laughs> Well, the scriptures actually condemn overeating. So that was put out precautionary. and said, think about it. Let's recognize everybody's not going to eat the same amount. It's going to vary. But that's what he's talking about there. Each one's own desire. To the former one that's just a little eater, you're not going to ever tempt him with food. I don't care what you fix. But with others, it's a problem. Or take the problem of alcoholic beverages. Now, I'm sure if I ask, but I'm not asking this for any show of hands or anything, but I'm sure that there are probably some here who do not drink alcoholic beverages at all. And if you were to take a few of them and draw them out, they could explain, well, I don't have anything against it, I just don't care for it. So you say, have you ever tried it? Yes. What did you think of it? I didn't like it. I didn't like the way it tastes. I didn't like the way it smelled. I didn't like the effect it had on me. So I don't drink it. They know that scripturally they can drink in moderation. They know that's not a sin, that's not condemned by God, but they don't care for it. So you could have them over for a gathering and you could have your super bar working. But they'll say, well, I'll take a Perrier with a twist and put a little ice in it, and that's, that's what they're going to have. They don't like alcohol. It doesn't appeal to them. They know they could drink it, but they don't care for it, and they don't. So it is not going to be a temptation for them. The way you have an abundance of alcohol. On the other hand, yeah, we know them, don't we? See, there are some where this presents a real problem because they like the way it tastes. They like the effect it has on them. They enjoy it, and they have a good capacity for holding it. <laughs> now, those matters are not automatically condemned. You see, the Bible condemns drunkenness, alcoholism also is condemned, immoderation or over-drinking. But for a person who enjoys alcoholic beverages, 
and that may have a generous capacity for alcoholic beverages, that can be a temptation. And that's why sometimes when the friends have gatherings, social gatherings, and uh, they have alcoholic beverages there, that unfortunately some are not discreet. They go too far. Now, they may not uh, get intoxicated, but they may get high. See, that's a signal. That one has a problem with it. Alcohol is a temptation for him. Each one's own desire. So now, what he tells us by that is very clear. He's saying very clearly, you've got to know what your weakness is. Or more correctly, you've got to know what your weaknesses are. What appeals to one person does not necessarily appeal to the other person. We all have our different moral makeup or nature, but you see, in all of us, the weaknesses and imperfections are there. And a person is never going to begin to be able to cope with wrong desire until he's honest and he sits down and he honestly expresses what's wrong with me. And that in itself isn't a demerit. That is an honest recognition that we're all imperfect, we all have things that we have to deal with, that we have to struggle with. That was one honest thing that some of the excerpts I read you from some of the letters brought out. These were people just being honest, maybe very desperate at this point, but saying, I have this problem. I have these problems. I don't want to have them, but these are things that are strongly in me asserting themselves. So when it comes down to what's going to constitute your test, I think you notice how he put it there. Look again at the first part of that verse. But each one is tried. That's the point. So, your trial, our trial, our test, the real test each of us must face as a Christian is within. Yes, in some places they face persecution, imprisonment, hatreds, beatings from the authorities, confiscation of property and all. But the real test that everybody's going to face is right in here. How you're coping and handling the imperfections, the wrong desires, and there's no doubt in it. The way we try will be based on what our weaknesses are. If yours is not food, that's not a trial for you. It's going to be on whatever your weakness is. If it is not alcohol, fine. That is not the test you will have. But it's going to be whatever it is that you are vulnerable in. That's why a person then has to be very honest with himself. Now, let's see how it works. You're still looking there in uh, verse 14. Now, notice right there after where you see it says uh, each one is tried. Now, go over where it says and enticed by his own desire. Enticed. Take a look at that. Now, what does that mean, enticed? Now, if you were looking over the kingdom in a linear translation, where we get the definition of the Greek words, original language of the Bible, the original language word is defined there in the kingdom linear as being baited on. So, enticed goes back to that root thought or definition being baited on. In other words, it's talking about some lure or bait. 
Now, you think about first probably the fisherman. Because the fisherman uses a lure or bait to catch fish. But now, does he just get anything? I doubt it. A lot of you are fishermen and go out in boats around here. But you've got to know the type of fish you're after. And when you know the type of fish out there, then you have studied up on it, and you know the type of lure or bait to get. So having studied up on it, you've got the bait needed. You know the fish that's out there. So the fisherman throws his line over into the water. Proper bait on the hook. And sure enough, his line drops in a whole school of fish. And he's got the bait they prefer. All the professionals have said, that's what they go for. Now, you can kind of see that in your mind. Now, let me just ask you a question on it to think about. The fisherman has put his line over there. He has the proper lure on the line. His hook is baited properly. The fish are there all around it. Question then, are those fish in any danger because of that? Now think, don't just say the top thing that comes in your mind. Think, are the fish in imminent danger at all? Why? Well, you ask any fisherman there that's been in that situation, you see. The fish can swim by that and around it all day long. If they don't want to feed on it, they're not going to feed on it. And that's it. So they're not in any danger. You have not put them in a life-threatening situation because you baited on them. Those fish are only in danger if they decide they're going to go for your bait. Now, there is a difference, isn't there? The danger does not exist because they're baited on. The danger exists in their makeup. Do they decide they're going to go for it? Now, you see, that's a different problem. Well, try this one. You ever had a mouse in your house? <laughs> and you said, I'm going to catch this mouse. I hear mice like cheese. So you get your trap and you put cheese on it. And you go check it anxiously the next morning. And it's just like you left it. The mouse tried your flower that evening. He's not in any danger because you got your best trap on there with cheese on it. He can go on and do something else or whatever he wants. So merely being baited on does not create the danger. The danger is if our mental attitude and our heart makeup says, that's enticing to me, I'm going to go for it. But if there's strength there, spiritual strength, determination, wisdom from God, and prayer to God, you see, even though what is tempting and luring and appealing and attractive it will not pull over that one who has that going for him in his spiritual fiber and makeup. And you see, this is where many fall victim to this matter of uh, wrong desires because they know that's my weakness. That's what appeals to me. And they've not built up the spiritual stamina to face head on that weakness and not go for it. And then you have a problem. Now, it can work the other way, too. Look back there again. Because we're trying to get all out of this that we can. And verse 14. Now, right in front of enticed, you know, the parallel thought there, where it says, uh, drawn out, take a look at that. 
But each one is tried by being drawn out and enticed. So now there are two possibilities. We discussed enticed, being baited on. There's what constitutes the problem for you, the wrong and the weakness. But now what about drawn out? What are we being told there? Well, what's the implication of that thought, drawn out? Doesn't it suggest that that one had been in a place of retreat and safety and left it to go somewhere that wasn't safe? And that's what it's talking about. Go back to the fish. Some fish find safety, particularly smaller fish, under the rock or clefts or reefs and all underwater. And so to protect themselves from the bigger predators at sea, they stay back under there, they retreat under there. And as long as they're under there, the bigger fish can't get there to them. So in that place of retreat, they're safe. Unless they allow themselves to be drawn out from it. You see, if the fisherman has his bait there and bait on them, and they decide they're going to swim out from under there and uh, go after that bait, now you have a very serious problem. And that's the way it is with some people. Unfortunately, even sadly, they reach the place of safety and retreat, Jehovah's organization, away from the world but secure and safe. But you see, some cannot resist the temptation to move up close to wrong, to move up close to the sin. Now, they do not have in mind actually committing a sin or doing what is overt. They have in mind that there is some sensation in being close to what is wrong and what appeals to me. So they feel, I'm going to enjoy certain aspects of this. And so just like that fish in a place of retreat would leave it and swim up to the lure or the bait, sadly that's how some do. Because, see, they are guilty of the reasoning we talked about earlier. They think it's only a sin or wrong when I go and swallow the bait. So they're feeling like the fish. I'm going to swim up close to it because I get this nice sensation. I feel good. It's very titillating experience to be close to the raw. So they do the things that can give them that sensation. With in mind, I'm not going to go for the bait. And that's the trap right there. They do not recognize the power of wrong desire. And yet so many times you see the brothers and sisters getting into difficulty because they've decided, I'm going to take these liberties, but I'm not going to do the wrong. But while taking these liberties, they get caught in the trap that becomes irreversible and they can't get back to the place of retreat, God's organization, or under the rocks and away from the predators of Satan's world and his system of things. But now here's the surprising part. And it's caught a many. Like the fish, they feel they can swim out from under the place of safety in the rock, move up closer to the wrong. Now they feel beyond that, that's the theocratic boundary line. I'm not going to pass that because that means I'm out of the organization. I, can be this fellowship for it. I'm just going to go up close to it and enjoy some of its aspects, and then I'm going to get back in the place of safety and retreat. See, this is the type of thinking that goes on. This is the mentality that they have developed. But what they fail to realize is that once you leave the place of safety, God's organization, the place of retreat, and once you start, so to speak, swimming in dangerous worldly waters, moving closer to the raw, that you get to a point where you cannot recover from that position and get back even before 
in many cases, the wrong is done. And that's why when many persons fall victim to serious sin, they often open up telling the brothers judging it. Something like, I never thought I'd do something like this. I just didn't have it in mind. I just never thought that that was me, that I could get in that situation. And in a sense, it's true. They did not ever feel they would because they only had in mind leaving the place of safety, stretching the principles, moving up close to the wrong, enjoying some of the sensations by being close to it, and then getting back. They fail to realize you get to the point of no return before you commit the sin. That when you go in the direction of wrong or sin, that there is a point you get to no return where you can't get back even though you haven't maybe swallowed the bait as yet. Now, let me illustrate it. See what you like here. I got two illustrations. I'll just use the one you like the best. How many play chess? Raise your hand. You play chess. Hands down. How many can play checkers? Okay, checkers obviously got it. Okay, you got your board set up. And let's call one player A and the other B. They're at the beginning. Now, A, after five moves, the first five moves, has moved in a superior sense and has started to penetrate the line of B. Five moves. Now, B hasn't been successful, but what would you say about it? He's still in the game. It's a long ways to go. Now, there are five more moves, and once again, A each time moves in a superior way. Now, A has penetrated the line. He's been crowned a couple times, and now he's starting to stack up B's men. How's it looking for B? Well, not too prospective, but the game isn't over. He still has a chance, doesn't he? Three more moves. A moves in a superior way again. He's almost devastated B. B is down to just a man or two. A has got kings crowned all around and all over the line penetrating. Now, B realizes now that no matter what he does, he can't win the game. It's not over. <laughs> but he knows now there's nothing he can do. He only got two men there. <laughs> so the game's got to go on, so B is your move, so he just uh, slide it over here. <laughs> uh, he knows it's hopeless. He reached a point where he cannot win. He cannot recover from. So before the game is over, or at least before the last move has taken place, he's lost. Likewise, when it comes to pursuing sin, and while many foolishly think, I can move into dangerous worldly waters, into the direction of wrong, and I'm going to get so far and then go back. No, you can reach that point of no return before you reach the point of sin. And that's what happens to many as they go out there, that they get so far in that direction, and then they're caught up in the wrong desire. It becomes the all-important thing. It becomes a thing they have a passion for. It consumes them fully. It becomes, as we read early, a selfish craving, a longing in them, and it overwhelms them, and all of a sudden it takes them and it catapults them out of God's organization back into the world. And they thought they were going to go back. They thought that they were going to just enjoy certain aspects of the wrong. But they forgot one important thing, that desire, longing, selfish craving, 
can become such a consuming thing that with the human creature can catch them up in it by surprise and just snatch them up and catapult them out of God's organization and back with whirlings. See, that's why he said, did you take a good look at that? Look again. In 15 he says, then the desire, when it has become fertile, gives birth to sin. In turn, sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. So, you see, we're talking about fertility. Now, compare that, I want you to look at a psalm there, number 7. Let's make this comparison, because here, now, it graphically brings to our attention just what he's talking about here, and I point when it, the sin becomes fertile, and the point at which it becomes fertile. Look at Psalm 7. Now, focus on uh, verse number 14. And it says, look, there is one that is pregnant with what is hurtful, and he has conceived trouble and is bound to give birth to falsehood. Get the picture? When a woman is pregnant, then what can we say? She's bound to give birth in the natural course of things. So he says, there is one pregnant with what is hurtful. You see, the fertility has set in. So what is he going to do? He's bound to give birth to what's wrong. And that's the point of no return where one is just caught up, overwhelmed, consumed in the raw, and it can grab hold of that one and catapult him out of the organization. Over 73,000 the past couple of years. They didn't know the power of wrong desire. They thought they had everything under control. They thought they could tamper with the wisdom of God and enjoy even temporarily the musings of sin or the titillating aspects of wrongdoing or the sensations and thrills and dividends the world seeks caught him off guard. So, our point then is, do you recognize the power of wrong desire? See, it's very easy to say, yes, I recognize it. But does our course of action indicate we do? So that we have eliminated all of the various aspects and ramifications of actions that lead to wrongdoing. Now, look in 1 John chapter 2, because here we have an acknowledgement of our actual situation. 1 John chapter 2, now, verse 15. So, he says there, Do not be loving either the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him because everything in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desire of the eyes and the showy display of one's means of life does not originate with the Father but originates with the world. Furthermore, the world is passing away and so is its desire. But he that does the will of God remains forever. Now, he sums it up. See, he says, now the world is going to bait you on. And he tells us how. He says, everything in the world, everything. You name it, if it's in the world, then it's going to fit into either the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, or the showy display of one's means of life. That's what the world is dangling before all of God's people, so there's nothing we can do about it. We are going to be baited on. And there's something on that lure that's going to appeal to all of us. So the question is, will we be drawn out? We can do something about that. We can't do anything about being baited on because Satan has been baiting 
mankind for 6,000 years. The world is his instrument. It baits all. Everything in it is bad, and they dangle there the desire of the flesh. It's everywhere you go. It's designed to appeal to our imperfect and sinful inclinations. Nothing we can do about it. But we can make it our determination that we're not going to be drawn out. We can make it our determination that we've gone to the place of retreat and safety. We're going to stay there. And that's no matter what he has on that lure. His entertainment world is filled with bait or lures. Catch God's people. Movies, televisions, video, music. It's not by accident it's all filled with sensuality. It's all designed to arouse and create desire and move people to want to act on imperfect inclinations. I know there's some who still argue for it and say, it doesn't have any effect on me. They're still going to restricted movies. They're still renting restricted video cassettes. They're still listening to sensual music because they feel it doesn't have any effect on me. Now, let me ask you something. All right, I'll set up the situation. All right, there she is. She's sitting in the movie house. The film is restricted. Now, in a restricted film, they are allowed to uh, simulate sexual intercourse. You're allowed to have bedroom scenes. You're allowed to simulate fornication, adultery. Now, there she is in the movie house. When she said it didn't have any effect on me, it's just a film. Now, she heard this film had these bedroom scenes in it. And because it had a good soundtrack, and one of her favorites doing the singing in it. She was going anyway. So she's sitting there. Now on the scene, the cameras go right now into the bedroom. And people start taking off clothes. Now she's sitting there in trance, eating her popcorn. <laughs> and, you know, the cameras start zooming in and... They go through these scenes, and you start seeing flesh and here and all. Now, there she's sitting there watching this. Now, let me ask, what is she thinking about? <laughs> Do auxiliary pioneering next month? <laughs> uh, don't tell me it doesn't have any effect on her. You've got to think on what you're looking at. If you're looking at fornication and adultery, that's what you're thinking about. That's what's in mind and heart. And everything in your mind is going to have an effect on the mind and in the heart. So you can't say it doesn't have any effect on you. It's teaching you what is wrong. You're being baited on, and then you're going for it because you're drawn out to try to see that type of entertainment. So there is no argument. It doesn't have any effect on me. I just go for the story. <laughs> no, it's that titillation and sensation. That's why they're there. See, it's that arousal that uh, they're seeking. That's why they're there. That's the bait. That's the lure. And some allow themselves to be drawn out and go for it. Now, others, they try to be discreet. I, I may be even sneaky. They're going to rent it now. <laughs> For a small package, and they go in the <laughs> video store. I'm in this club, they say. <laughs> the good ones, they say, we have in the back, sir. <laughs> Picks it up, this one. I've heard about it. Spicy. I'm going to rent this baby and take it on home. 
<laughs> the lures are out there. You can't do anything about it. That's just the way it is, the kind of world we live in. That's what he said. Everything in the world, the desire of the flesh, it's all out there. So our only real hope is not to be drawn out, to be determined. It's wrong even to imagine it and desire it. If it comes in mind and heart, and it will, we throw it out instantly, and then we start pumping in there the right things. You see, that's why the organization is giving us such encouragement. Come to meetings. Come to assemblies. Read some in your Bible each day. Because just like wrong desires can pull one over in that direction, when we focus very heavily on reading the Bible and studying it, being at meetings, and coming under Jehovah's Spirit and being built up by that, we are building up powerful right desires. And so they push us in the right direction. And that's what all of us need to combat this inadvertent buildup of wrong desires in the world all around us. Look there in Philippians chapter 4, and here we receive very good encouragement there. And following this can be life-saving to us. And here is really what needs to happen in all our cases. Philippians 4, look at verse 8. It says, Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are of serious concern, whatever things are righteous, whatever things are chaste, whatever things are lovable, whatever things are well spoken of, Whatever virtue there is, and whatever praiseworthy thing there is, now, what does he say? Continue considering these things, the things that you learned as well as accepted and heard and saw in connection with me. Practice these, and the God of peace will be with you. That's how we succeed. If we get fully absorbed in these things, the things that are chaste, pure, clean, decent, the good material the discreet slave is sending to us now, and we make the good habit of reading our watchtower, reading our wake, taking our Bible each day, doing some reading in that, mulling over those things, and when these bad things enter mind and heart, throw them out immediately and start pumping in these right things, well, he says, practice these, do these force ourselves to do it, and this will more than counteract the buildup of what is wrong. No, we can't entirely eliminate wrong desires as long as we're in this system. They're going to come. We all have weaknesses. They're going to surface at times. We're going to go through things where we have to struggle. But remember, none of us can triumph in our own strength. Even after we've done all that we can, we need that power beyond what is normal that comes from God, but he will give it to us when we put forth a determined effort to do the right thing. So examine yourself. Honestly evaluate yourself. And recognize that what you think about can affect what you do. What you do can affect your everlasting life. So if we think about the right things and we do the right things and discipline and force ourselves to do what is right, then we're going to be able to please God, offset those wrong desires, entertain and build and cultivate right ones. And then Jehovah's going to reward those persons for meeting the challenge in these wicked last days, not going along with the crowd, not giving in, and becoming weakened by these things, but recognizing they're in a real fight, a real struggle. And those who put it up then are going to come off victorious. So make it your personal determination. Tell yourself it as often as you have to. I know the power of wrong desire. That it's wrong, it's death-dealing, it's life-threatening, and I'm rejecting them entirely. And then build yourself up with these right things, and then you will be one blessed on that clean earth under God's 
administrative government and to the final analysis work your way through a thousand years throwing off all imperfection and unrighteousness and finally having only right desires and fully in control and suitable to serve God from there uh, for eternity. We need to think about that reward, think about that prize, and not let anything in these evil, wicked days sidetrack us for a few moments of pleasure and enjoyment temporarily of sin. Reject wrong desires. Cultivate those that are right and gain that fine reward for those that Jehovah will bless.